All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Keep Calm. It's just a snake podcast. Uh, as always, I'm Jay Z, and with us we have a really, really cool guest today. Uh, one of the amazing people we met up on our recent trip up to Alaska. How you doing, bud? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. All right, and uh, you are one half of the Reptile Barn, correct? Well, yeah. So one quarter, technically. My brother and his yeah. wife uh, do it with us. So my wife Elizabeth and I, uh, we've been doing this for about going on seven years. Uh, my brother Caleb and his wife Yoshimi uh, are our business partners. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, I we didn't get too too much into it uh, during our quick little video because it's hard to cram, you know, a whole lot of reptile talk into like a fifteen minute video. Right. Um, but did we see the majority of the collection, or just kind of your half? Um. So the room that we were standing in. That's the majority of our ball pythons. Mm-hmm. I did not show you all of our morphs, you know, but uh, yeah. they're all ball pythons. Um, I don't think we pulled out the Dominican boas. I think they were breeding at the time. Yeah, they were locked up. Uh, but yeah, you saw the majority of our species at least. Uh, okay. It's not, you know, of course not every single animal because that would have taken a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, you got a good handle on what we keep. Okay, cool. So with that being in mind, um, now... Correct me if I'm wrong. You guys aren't originally from Alaska, correct? Correct. So, so oh, okay. yeah, I I was raised here. I consider myself, you know, Alaskan now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I, as a little kid, I was born in Utah when my parents were going to school. Uh, then we moved to the D.C. area for a few years. But then as a, you know, small child moved up here. And then... I went on uh, a mission for two years for the church that I belong to in Brazil, and that was a lot of fun. Cool. So I lived out of the state for, it ended up being for like six years, because right after that, I went to college out of state. Right. Um, so, you know, my young adulthood, I wasn't here, uh, but I've lived up back up here for several years now once I got married. Cool. Um, is that kind of when you first got into keeping reptiles? Yeah, so... We kind of came across the idea while we were, because I, I was a conservation major, wildlife conservation. Mm-hmm. So I knew a lot of, you know, wildlife people and just animal lovers in general. And some master's students were talking about, you know, careers in this field. And because uh, the vast majority of people who go to school for, you know, environmental science or biology and things, you know, a lot of them become veterinarians a lot of them go into like wildlife management sorry right. my daughter's playing with the light but we'll get that yeah it's okay um, there's a dog howling in our basement so yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and you know being a, a state biologist or fish and game or something like that 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 could be a fun career but i i you know sounds rebellious i don't i don't think of myself as that rebellious but i did not want to work for anybody else i always Fair wanted enough. to work for myself right so we heard these master students talking about animal breeding you know, as a career, as a you know, full-time hmm. gig. And I had never thought about it. Although looking back, of course, people are doing it. Otherwise, how do you go to a pet store and see all these captive bred animals? For right, sale? exactly. But I just never thought about it. And I kept a corn snake even as a little kid and stuff. But so I started looking into it. And we found all the big YouTube channels that everybody knows. And uh, we're like, wow, these people, this is their whole career. But I was still at college. We didn't own a house. or just renting. So... I called up my brother and he was interested. So I conned him into kind of taking care of all the animals we started <laughs> buying nice. for my last year of college. So that we didn't have to wait an extra year to get started. So he took care of everything. He was breeding them all winter. You know, we, we ended up being able to buy some adults nice. from Fred Kicks, uh, you know, Kicks Balls, mm-hmm. reptiles. And uh, so that was kind of how we got started. And my wife was raised in rural Arkansas. So nothing to do with Alaska, you know. But yeah, but we've been here for several years. We plan on sticking. Cool. Yeah, if I if I remember correctly, guys, we're we're looking into putting an offer into a house, if I remember correct. It just got accepted. Actually. Nice. Cool. That's awesome. Yep. So you're gonna that's that's gonna be a fun little slow transition. Oh yeah, anyone who uh, has moved a large collection, I'm sure, is just cringing for me right now. But <laughs> right. But you didn't you didn't ever have to move any of the collection 
um, to Alaska, did you? Your brother was Correct. was oh, okay. Correct. Cool. All right. Well, that, that certainly makes things easier. I know yes. uh, talking to to Jonathan uh, about like the shipping back and forth, it can be a bit of a headache. So definitely, uh, which is actually kind of what a little bit of what I want to ask about because you know there's not too many like big breeders up there other than you guys, or is there? Yeah, and, and as you saw, you know, we're, we're certainly not big, but uh, we're definitely trying to do it professionally and grow and become, uh, you know, full time. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, as far as breeders, uh, there's a, actually a, quite a strong hobby up here, surprisingly, maybe, but not very many people doing it, trying to do it as their profession, I would say. Right. So, you know, they are very professional, but not on any scale. There it is, yeah. Definitely Uh, more still hobby-centered. Exactly. So, yeah, uh, you know, shipping in general, here in Anchorage, honestly, not terrible. Mm -hmm. Because we have a big FedEx hub up here, uh, you know, so everything can still get overnighted and routed through Memphis or Indianapolis, like everywhere else in the country. Um, Being that our climate is so cold for more of the year, it can cause some some hassles you know uh it's really not so much summer and winter it's in between it's the spring and fall because you know we're in north america it's a cold climate through most of the country compared to much of the world right you know people get used to if you're in minnesota i guarantee it gets colder where you're at than where i'm at in anchorage alaska that seems strange to people they think of alaska as this barren frozen (laughs) wilderness but uh I'm right on the coast, you know, and so the the ocean keeps it a little more temperate. Yep, exactly. But the cold season here, because we're so far north, it lasts so long. Yeah. You know, by the time it's late September, it's cold. It might not be snowing, but it's cold. Um, And the rest of the country is still enjoying a nice warm end of summer, you know? Right. Uh, So it's really when it's drastically different temperatures here, as opposed to the place we're shipping to or shipping from, that's when we get into trouble. And we have a large margin on either side of the summer where that is the case, unfortunately. Yeah. So, but that's, that's mostly with live animal sales with shipping, like standard freight of a lot of like the dry goods and stuff. That's still, it's a different headache just because people don't like to ship up there. Exactly. Exactly. So you know, you run into the, we just won't ship to you, period, Yeah, a lot. And that is so frustrating. I'll, I'll be like, okay, can I, can I, out of my experience, you know, fighting this, can I offer you like some suggestions of how you could ship right. to me? I'm covering the shipping costs. You know, I'm not, I would never expect some business to subsidize shipping to me. That That's that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to say, I know for a fact, there's some companies that will ship from your place to my place. (laughs) Can I, and sometimes they just like, Nope, Nope. Won't do it. Won't do it. Yeah. It's, um, you know, they'll ship to Hawaii sometimes, (laughs) which is way worse. (laughs) I was going to say, yeah. Um, then there's, you know, just the, the basic cost of shipping up here. Uh, A lot of places still rely on trucking. And it's incredibly expensive to truck stuff up here through Canada. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you can, sometimes you can fly it if it's not too big, but you know, if you're buying four rodent racks and they're on pallets, they're not going to fly that. No. Um, so sometimes, you know, there's barges that come up here so you can ship by sea, but your prices are just you know shooting through the roof. I imagine. Yeah. There is one company that I actually just discovered it's based here in Anchorage. They're called Lulu Shipping or something like hmm. that. They got tired of this issue, um, and they bought a shipping yard in Seattle. And then they bought – I'm not sure if they own a barge or if they uh, got permits for, you know, trucks going through Canada. Either way, they will let you kind of purchase things in their name, hmm. and it will be shipped to their yard in Seattle, and then they will truck it up here. So it's still, you know, you're going to pay a lot. You're going to pay the initial shipment. uh, And then you're going to pay again to this company. But at least if there's product that you must have, you have a way to get it now. That's awesome. That's, that's really good. Cause I know it's when I was, when I was thinking about this and I know we didn't get, we didn't get a chance to get too much into it. I'd imagine that there's probably a lot of kind of DIY, 
like setups and things like that just because of that issue right and so going for like the bigger scale or try to you know emulate some of these other like big professionals it's you'd have to go through this very large yep i, I mean headache really and the the one thing that uh you know I, I know people that do this and we will i'm sure end up doing this at some point <laughs> uh, once our business is larger and our you know just our our regular overhead is very large if we can save up and buy twenty thousand dollars worth of goods in one oh, sorry just hit the computer yeah, uh, all at once and then what we would do is fly down to the states we would buy a trailer and we would drive that trailer through the states you know winding our way through stopping at you know freedom breeder ars whatever oh, we need because you know driving from the middle of the country all the way to anchorage cost me about 600 bucks of gas. Okay. okay? If I'm going to be buying stuff and the cumulative shipping cost is $7,000. That's true. Then it's worth it to me to just make, you know, take a family trip or, or, you know, maybe just me and my brother and we book our way up with barely any sleep or whatever the case may be. Right. It would, it over the long run, it would save us thousands and thousands of dollars. And then you take the trailer and you sell it when you get up here, every time you do this. Because they're worth a lot more up here than they are down there, you know? That's true. Um, so anyway, that's something that there are people who do that. They just drive it themselves. Uh, but you got to have the time, you know? My wife works full time. We do the business more than full time. We've got <laughs> young kids. So right now it's not so viable. But when our kids are a little older and uh, my wife is no longer working uh, other jobs and we're just doing the business, that's definitely something that we could also do to kind of offset that just obscene amount of shipping cost. Right. Yeah. That's, that's actually a really good idea. I like that, you know, you're still kind of having this, I mean, kind of like this niche market that you're hopefully trying to like corner a little bit. Now, are you going to do any sort of like resale or like small outlet or anything like that? Yes. If, if you get to that point, like as long as we're spitballing future ideas. Yep. So we have a giant poster in our room right now, actually with, kind of each phase of our next steps, you know, mm -hmm. and the next thing, now that we just purchased a house, you know, we can't close for another month or whatever, but right. this space we're renting right now, we will continue renting and it will only be for the business. Uh, so we will take a couple of the rooms. We'll put in a bunch of, you know, gorilla racks or whatever, some shelving, and we will stock up on, you know, uh, bedding, lights, heat, caging, substrates of any sort uh you know frozen rodents whatever the case may be so that we can begin functioning more as a pet store a specialized reptile pet right. store as opposed to only the breeder selling the animals themselves nice i know that's i know a lot of other breeders like down here in the lower 48 have toyed with it a little bit and i think like will banks is doing like a whole thing now too but that's, I always thought that was something that I wish more people were able to do or just did in general, where um, even just like giving a really good care sheet or just being available for answering questions, but to actually say, okay, you know what, here is, here's this animal, you, you have the setup and now let's work together and get it all set up and you get all the stuff from the same person. So you can just kind of have this yep. ready to go and there you go. And so for kind of, you know, what, it definitely does seem like you guys are a very growing like a very rapidly expanding hobby up there, but still it seems like the kind of breakthrough barrier is a little bit higher than it is down here just because of Agreed. the hassle essentially. In, in general, across all industries, Alaska just seems to be 10 or 15 years behind on growth. Yeah. You know, you'll even see it in fashion trends. You know, <laughs> when, when Alaskans started wearing Crocs, you know, those, those lightweight shoes with the holes all over them. Yep. People down in the States are like, oh, we haven't worn those for the last like five years, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and awesome. it's just, it's like that up here. That's fine. And you know, I'm in Anchorage. I'm spoiled. People out in the bush, we call yeah. it, you know, rural Alaska, but I'm talking rural. Like th This is more rural than other states rural. Like one shack for several oh, man. miles and that's Off it. Off the grid, 
completely and totally isolated. You know, they, there are communities that they still have to come into big city, you know, big cities, right? Like Fairbanks out in interior Alaska mm-hmm. on a snow machine or on you know, a snowmobile, I guess you would call it. Right, or yeah. a sled dog team. Like literally, there are people who travel by sled dogs still. And that's oh, yeah. not, I'm not saying like, oh, all Alaskans are like this, but <laughs> that still exists up here. Oh, yeah. You know? And shipping for them means they travel for three days to get to a city so that they can pick up their shipment that ships to that oh, city. You know, what's FedEx supposed to do? Yep. Exactly. <laughs> they, they don't have a fleet of small float planes that can land on your nearby lake to deliver your packages, you know? Yep. It's just, so I'm spoiled in Anchorage, you know, we're a, we're an international hub for shipping to Asia. So a lot of shipping uh, companies have built facilities in this city, even though Anchorage isn't that big, you know, I, I think there's 300,000 people or so here. Um, yeah. So it's not a big enough market to just naturally draw in huge companies, but it's strategically placed such that it's still, we get enough right. uh, interest, I guess. So it's not as bad as other places in the state, but. True. But I don't know. It's, it seemed like it was pretty hopping when we were there. It's, you know, that yep. it looks very similar to a lot of other just kind of suburban areas. Yep. But then that, yep. again, that's, you know, that's, big places like Anchorage or I assume Juno and places Juno's like that. not Juno's not huge. Uh Fairbanks is the next largest city. Oh, okay. Uh, that's you know way up in the interior. Um and even like, you know, you went up and visited Jonathan. She's in Palmer, mm-hmm. the Palmer Wasilla area. That's a growing area. So there are some population centers, but uh overall it's just I mean, we're probably the third or fourth smallest state by population. It's just not a ton of people here. That's true. But I mean that's you know kind of the trade off that you get. But, you know, it's yep. worth it for a lot of people, and it's really fun up there. Yep. Oh, I, I love it here. I think it's great. I, I'm not interested in having, you know, a mega city, but it would mm-hmm. be nice if there were some, you know, industry support. You know, if you're in – one time I was – I think I was watching uh, Prehistoric Pets, you know, Jay Brewer. Right. I was thinking about it. He's got his reptile zoo, which looks amazing. I'd love to visit someday. It's pretty cool. But uh, he's in Los Angeles or, or nearby – yeah he doesn't have to do much to get lots of foot traffic through you know (laughs) there's there's 10 million people around him (laughs) you know true um if i were to open a zoo the the amount of advertising and uh, i mean it would just be staggering amount of work to try and make it profitable um because not only is my city not huge there's not other large cities close by to draw from yep and it's already a bit of a niche to begin with yep like every, yep. i mean there it's really cool and people enjoy it but there's still the whole homage of you know lions tigers and bears and so not yep. everybody's even though you know a large impressive constrictor or a big water monitor or something like that is still a draw but not as much unfortunately but that came up a lot you know in my major at school it's pretty easy to get conservation dollars and donations for a big you know, generally a mammal <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, that's impressive. It's kind of a, a a species that everybody knows about. All the little kids know what a tiger is, know what a uh, elephant is, and all that. But you have like you know an endangered species of garter snake. It's hard right. to get, it's hard to get support for the conservation of of reptiles in general. That's true. That was uh, do they cover like Rom Whitaker's work at all in that course? Just um, the the herpetologist you mean mm-hmm. so we had a couple of courses that went over you know experts in each in each field right um, but so much of my specific major was mostly about management oh, okay general. yeah so uh, i you know there was a there was one of the professors was a, a herpetologist you know by profession and so he got deep into that stuff, mostly with his master's students. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I'd love to, I'd love to go farther into education. And um, you know, I took some genetics mm-hmm. classes that were just fascinating and things right. like that. Yeah, that, that gets really complicated. I was just kind of curious because it's like you said, it's, it's easy to get the fluffy ones to get, you know, cause it's 
it's really how you have to do it is kind of with funding from external sources. But as you said, with a species of garter snake or a species of crustacean or a spider that no one's heard about, that's just hard in general. Yep. Well, and you get a huge amount of the population of people who are like, ew, let it die. Yeah, that's, I've yeah. always hated that part. You know, it's, yep. you know, it's what you don't, you wouldn't say that about a dog. Why? Why? Yep. That's somebody's baby too. And, you know, I think this is important in our, in our hobby, in the reptile world, because there are several popular, popular YouTubers, you know, Brian Barcheck or whoever mm -hmm. that, it's just, ooh, my lights just went out. Do I still show up okay? You're still there. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're um, fine. <laughs> that uh, it is so popular to just bash on these people. Um, and maybe they do stuff wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, I'll defend any massive YouTuber who's into, you know, pet tubing or whatever. Yep. But the work that they do for the hobby is astronomical. They That's bring true. millions of eyeballs to reptiles and put a positive spin on them for people. You know, my YouTube channel reaches a few hundred people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not going to convince the world that reptiles are cool. I'd love to, and I'll try, I'll do my part. But some of these people who are really good at social media and they love reptiles, they are, they are supporting the rest of us. They really are. You know, I'll get customers all the time. And not just for snakes, but, you know, maybe they just want rodents. Maybe mm -hmm. they want, you know, reptichip or whatever. And they didn't hear of, the, of snakes because of me. They came because of snake discovery or Clint's reptiles or, or yep. Brian Barcheck or whoever. And so if those people do something very egregiously wrong as a hobby, we should call them out, of course. Yep. But I feel like a lot of people are also just jealous of their success. And... I just want to be cautious about tearing down the most successful promoters of our hobby, because if we don't promote our hobby, the world is not going to promote it for us. Yep, exactly. And that's, that's definitely something that I've always tried to kind of be like a little bit of like a level headed person, like when you just kind of hanging out talking reptiles to other people. And it's, it's like you said, you know, that's, I mean, we got into it, but it really like kind of opened your eyes about how much there was in the hobby because of you know people like brian and such and like there's no way that they obviously love animals there's no way they could do it as often as consistently and as long as they have without loving them and yeah millions of people so it's you know when you put your life out there like that all the time constantly you're bound to get hate either because they don't like how you do it or as you said, that they're jealous of their success. Every single one of us wishes that we can make this our full-time job and that's it. We didn't have to do anything else, just talking reptiles, breeding reptiles, showing them off. That's, oh, geez, there goes the pop filter. Um, that's just what we all wish we could do, but that's, they uh, only a few can manage to do that. And it's like, yep. screw that up. <laughs> but but uh, while we're talking about that, um i know that you guys put on your own uh reptile expo for the first time not last year so 2019 correct 2019 yep nice sorry as i sit here and screw with this still no problem, um, no problem and i know that was really successful right it was shockingly successful yeah and again we got to consider scale you know we're in a small state it's a small population but for us and our expectation it was wildly successful Right. You know, we didn't we didn't rent out a huge venue because we didn't expect to need to. Um, so really, the only problem was that there were too many people. Really, it was too crowded. They had trouble getting up to the tables to see the vendors. They had trouble with the huge line to get in. Uh, we, we ended up having like a thousand people come. Jeez. And it was awesome. But yeah. we need a bigger venue and we, we're going to try and do one this year. Uh, I haven't really spread the word out yet because we're still nailing down details with the venue. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the next week or two, we'll be announcing like, yep, we're, we're going. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really cool. And I, it's, that's not the worst problem to have, you know, to have right. too many people show up. So that way, at least, you know, there's the interest of it in general. Yep. So that's really cool. Um, so I know that your business, it's your business is kind of multifaceted, correct? You do, the breeding as well as a lot of social media. And then you also do a lot of the, the outreach programs and uh, shows and stuff like that too, correct? Yep. We do a lot of birthday parties, 
groups of any sort. We'll let them come here, you know, into our tiny little apartment, or we'll take uh, some of our most uh, friendly and, and calm animals out to people. And uh, we've had, you know, Boy Scout troops and all sorts of different groups come. Uh, we will, you know, the expo was a massive amount of work, but it was so worth it. And we'll try and do that every single year now, you know, barring any future pandemics, of course. Right. Uh, yeah, we're just starting to get into dry goods. Um, you know, we do sell feeders and things, uh, but we're going to try and be able, my, my goal would be that at least for a couple of species, somebody could come here, they could pick out their snake, we could meet them. I really prefer meeting people that I'm going to actually send an animal home with. I do yeah. ship, we ship all over the country. But in those cases, I generally, you know, I want to talk to them on the phone or, or many, many messages back and forth. I'm just more comfortable when I meet the person and I can gauge how ready they are. Right. That doesn't mean I won't sell to a newcomer to the hobby, but I want to help them educate themselves first, if that's the case. Yeah, exactly. Um, but anyway, yeah. So we'd like for these people to be able to come here, look through the animals, select one that they really like, and then I can send them home with their cage and their light or their heat source, their thermostat. So many people don't understand how important thermostats are. Yep. <laughs> the keeping world, a temperature gun, you know, they're, they have those little sticky circle thermometers that they put on. I'm like, that's fine. I, I like to know the air temperature too, but they don't understand. There's so many things about a reptile is different from a dog or, or whatever, or exactly. even a fish or whatever. So I'd like them to be able to just walk out with everything. They have their first month of food. They have the substrate they're going to use. They have the cleaning product they're going to use. Um, and so that would be my goal for kind of this calendar year. By the end of this calendar year, that's where I want to be. Because we'll, we'll be moved out. Our family will be moved out of this space mm -hmm. this summer. So we'll have, you know, six months to really spice this place up a little bit. Nice. And that also involves, you know, getting in a bunch of those dry goods and supplies and stuff yeah. like that. Does like a reptile supply company ship to you guys or? Yeah. Yeah. So like we order a lot of things from the Serpentarium. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, uh, what's the, the major one? Like, I always forget their name, even though it's real obvious reptile basics mm -hmm. um, or any of the, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where you like to go on your pot. I'm not a huge fan of like, you know, backwater reptiles, triple L, some of those big flippers. I mean, as much as, you know, everyone has their opinions about things, I just try not to, like, openly bash people in general. Right, right. But beyond that. Right. But they do they do ship up here. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, we have plenty of options for, for resale of, of products and things. There used to be a guy who lived real close to us who did custom enclosures, and he was just an artist. Yeah. He was marvelous. He moved out of state. So I would love to support other local businesses. You know, we'll probably always source our insects through, through uh, a few of the local businesses up here. There's one called the Alaska Feeder Farm. There's the Alaska Bug Dealers. There's some really excellent small businesses up here that are kind of, you know, they're not selling the reptiles themselves, but they are part of the support industry. Yep. And that's, that's a big part of the industry that affects a lot of people that I think... Yep. It takes a while for people to fully grasp that part. Right. Um, no. I was oh, actually going to ask, do you, I know I mean, you're not personally breeding rodents, correct? We do. We breed some. Okay. So uh, Alaska allows you to have rats. The city that I am in Anchorage does not. Okay. And we could have a whole spiel on that if you wanted to, but uh, I am unwilling to break the city ordinance. I'm not going to sneak around and, and right. break so that causes a problem because it's massively more expensive to purchase rodents than to breed them yourself. Right. So we end up ordering from Rodent Pro or whoever, and that's our frozens, but live, we're just out of luck. We, we don't feed off live rats, period. Okay. So we have a, a, a reptile that absolutely refuses frozen thawed. They will get mice or gerbils, and boy, do I take a lot of hate for that. Yep. I know. Or, or even like small rabbit kits. Yep. And, you know, in my opinion, all of these animals deserve respect. The life of a gerbil just is not more valuable than the life of a mouse to me. That, that's ridiculous. Yeah. I never understood those like weird invisible lines that people draw where like because it's an accepted pet in one aspect, even though 
domestic mice can be just as interactable and personable and even empathetic pets as a gerbil oh, or a rat, yes, yep. if not more so. And like we do it too with like dogs and cats and then, you know, with other livestock too. So I just. You're right. You know, if someone, if someone feeds a dog to their big retic, to me, they're a monster. <laughs> but, exactly. But that's my value judgment that really isn't based. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, my brother has walked into pet stores before to buy some mice and all they had left were fancy mice. Yeah. And they know he's a reptile person and they won't sell to him. Oh, man. And he's like, you you sell feeder mice that are white. Yes. Because it's a feeder mouse. And they're like, yeah, but you can't have the, the fancy mice. They're not for feeders. And I'm like, you know, they're both mus- musculus. The, the, the species is the exact same thing, right? Are you are you racist? Like, can only yep. white mice be like, what in the world? Uh, but you're right. They've got a preconceived, this is for food. This is for pets. And, and to them, it just can't be broken. Yep. Then that's, I never, li- yeah, I never liked that. It's everything in life is really nuanced and it's, I don't like those just, you know, our bitch or, you know, arbitrary or habitual or arbitrary. I'm just going to keep slurring my words, arbitrary lines <laughs> that, you know, we just decided one day that's the way it is. Like pigs are delicious, but I mean, theoretically, they're smarter, more empathetic, and more personable than a dog or a cat ever could be. Yep. But, meh. Yep, I know what you mean. Yeah. But. Yeah. So, anyways, long story short, we do breed mice, we do breed gerbils, we do breed rabbits, we actually breed quail, um, dubia roaches, red runner roaches, mealworms, superworms, all the bugs. You know, uh, so we have a lot. We really only sell, because most of that's just for our own collection. We do sell quite a lot of mice. We sell rabbits, and we sell quail. Um, But really, as far as feeders go, pretty much just mice. The other things are just as we have them, you know, extra. Right. Well, actually, that's pretty good. We very often have mice shortages down here, like in kind of like the central part of the country. Like mm-hmm. everyone can breed rats and rats. So I've, I, I've been told cause I don't breed mice. Um, I don't really breed rats either, but I've been told that rats are easier to breed and it mm. seems like everyone breeds rats and mice are harder to come by or I'm not sure really what's up with that. We do great with our mice. Our mice are champions, man. Oh, we'll see. Awesome. We have a nice, you know, we bought a, an ARS rack for the mice. Uh, one of the 10 fifties. And it's great, and and they thrive. You know, we're we're feeding them good Missouri six F yeah. or whatever, like everybody does. Uh, we keep, you know, the one thing that I've noticed, we keep them a little cooler than almost anybody says to keep them. Yeah, and they thrive. And I wonder, you know, the, the that species of mouse is from Northern Europe. They mm-hmm. they evolved for cold. We keep them in the sixties usually. Uh, now in the summertime when it's hot out we, we can't keep them that cool you know we're not right. going to AC their <laughs> their place um, but in the winter we'll keep it in the 60s uh, in the summer we keep it in the 60s as much as we can you know if it's 83 degrees outside there's nothing we can do but exactly it's insulated and everything but yeah and we have noticed when we do have a hot stretch of summer they slow down their breeding a lot uh, hmm. so I have no data for you you know I haven't done control groups and experiments and all yeah. that. But yes. Then in a lot of states where the summers are really hot, they have trouble because of that. And they just don't realize it because the rats don't seem to have that problem. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know for sure. This is just going it's off. Of what, yeah. And but yeah, I think that's, awesome. what's up. Oh, I was just saying our, our mice have been spectacular. They're, we'll have our you know mama mouse with 13 babies still in her. Jeez. And she's still crawling upside down on the, on the, little rack and it's just incredible that's hilarious i i feel like that's actually kind of the case with a lot of animals in general like oh i feel like a lot of people keep like their ball pythons and their bow is also kind of a little hotter than they need to just in general and i'm wondering if that's i don't know where that came from or right what but I've, i've noticed a lot of people who keep more than just ball pythons or those who have been keeping for a long time have started to play a little bit. I've found a great deal of success from slightly cooler temps. And that goes for incubating too. Like I know 
last year we had uh, about 80 ball pythons hatch out. We lost one in incubation and they all went about 59 to 63 days, which is a little bit long for them, but they all hatched out big. So. And what do you incubate at? uh, Incubate at 86. So. Yep. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're probably right. And there was a time a couple of years ago, just for fun, I started following uh, hourly temperatures in, you know, Togo, Ghana, mm-hmm. some of these countries where there's just scads of ball pythons all over. Right. And the daytime temperatures and the nighttime temperatures match up fairly well with what you'll see on a care sheet to keep ball pythons. However, mm-hmm. underground, even eight inches underground was far cooler. Yeah. And, and that's worldwide. You know, you go underground and you're not getting direct sunlight and it's just going to be cooler. And most people agree. I've never been there, so I can't, you know, testify of my own experience, but they agree that they spend a lot of the daytime hours underground. Yep. And so I just wonder sometimes I'm like, you know, do they really want 85, 90 degrees all day long or in, in nature, would they be hiding underground where it's maybe high seventies, low eighties? I, I don't know. I, again, I, I, I wish I had a data set, but right. I'm just kind of speculating here that you're probably right. We probably keep a large majority of our boas and pythons a little hotter than they would choose on their own. Yeah. It's, it's almost kind of like, you know, we've, we've started to see that like North American colubrids, they're not out most of the time, even like the diurnal species, like the like a lot of the Pituophis or the Dry Marcon, they'll be out and cruising, but even then, it's not during the middle of the day. They're not out under the sun. And even then, it's still a good majority of the time underground, and we can see that, and we've started to reflect that in our husbandry and keeping with that, even with basking bulbs and things like that, that a lot of people necessarily wouldn't do. But I imagine that the behavior of a lot of snakes in those tropical areas are fairly close, right. fairly similar, where, you know, they're cryptid they spend a lot of time underground under brush basking when they need to thermoregulate and then because you know they're a prey item too right right so and you know i've had people just freak out when they see like my monitors i'll keep their basking spot at you know the surface temperature is 130 degrees and like you're gonna kill him and i'm like i, I promise i'm not you know yep. <laughs> they don't want their body temperature to be 130 degrees they want something that's hot enough that they can raise their body temperature relatively quickly so that they can come out on their hot branch or whatever and bask quickly. And then they can get back to cover. Yeah, exactly. And so under the cover in the shade, under a bunch of trees, there's no way it's 130 degrees. It's not going to even crack 90 most of the time. Yep. Even in the tropics. And so I don't know. I think, I think that it would be nice to get, a really like a trained scientist. I love the work that like Dave Kaufman does, you know, his, mm-hmm. his, his whole series of, are we keeping them correctly? But even he is not performing like a scientist, you know, he's observing, he's just taking observations. Yeah. I would love to get a, a trained herpetologist that would take some of these, and maybe this exists and I just don't know about it. There's probably probably something out there. Yeah. And, and just take a massive data set that we could, analyze statistically and be like actually when it's over 94 degrees in blah 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 country Mm -hmm. this species of reptile is four feet underground you know or you know people argue about everything in husbandry they're like you're feeding your ball path on too much or you're not feeding him enough like well what do they do in the wild can we somehow track a group of 100 ball pythons across all the different age cohorts and yep. see how frequently are they eating, what species are they eating, and what size was the prey item. Because then we could get a really good grasp of how much do we really need to feed them. Yep. And I don't, it's actually really weird to me that we don't have that with ball pythons because they have that with a lot of other species. Like we know that, you know, a lot of island, uh, like a lot of island boas or a lot of island, like uh, retic localities, they eat very seasonally. They eat very specific things during those seasons, sometimes not at all during the off seasons that, you know, that their prey items change from, you know, the wet or the dry or summer to winter. 
but we don't have that with ball pythons, which is weird because it's, you know, the single most popular reptile snake, at least, pet right. around the world. Right. So it's just kind of weird. Like, And then all the th- things that you have, it's either the old school people that say that, you know, they like a cramp, they like the tubs just to kind of, I don't know if it's like to kind of justify keeping that way. And then you have other people that say, no, they live in trees, whereas it turns out that study was done like 12 years ago during the rainy season when there was a shortage of rodents, period. Right. So. Yeah, I I don't like to get all accusatory on, on social media, but man, it drives me nuts when people try and tell me ball pythons are arboreal. I mean, just drives me nuts. you just look at the basic phy- physiology of the snake, like you just because it can go in the tree doesn't mean it won't but it doesn't mean that it's built to do that what i always tell people is more than 50 percent of humans really love swimming yes would you ever call homo sapiens aquatic correct (laughs) no way we're terrible in the water you know the most the most puny little goldfish in the world would destroy michael phelps in a (laughs) swim-off exactly and so I, of course a ball python is good. If it sees a delicious prey item climb up a tree, it's going to try and go get it. Exactly. It's, that doesn't mean that it's arboreal. Yeah, that's, that is one thing. That's, that's, I don't know if I'm ready to die on that hill, but that's not, yeah. No, that's not an excuse to say, oh, well, then a ball python can live in a tub this big. Exactly. Of course, if it's if it's allowed to stretch and move and get some, uh, interesting new things, you know, people are, are pushing really hard the whole field of, of, uh, oh, what's the word? The enrichment. Yep. Uh, and that's great. I'm, I'm 10,000% behind that movement, but we should still use some common sense and look at the physiology of the animal. Like you're saying, and just watch a ball Python climb, put a ball Python on a tree with narrow limbs and watch it carefully pick its way through and still fall sometimes. Exactly, yeah. And then put your your Amazon tree boa in that tree and watch it just right up. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously one of these animals was meant for this environment and one of them is just trying to get by. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and I think that's where the difference is between breeders and like hobbyist keepers, where as much as we don't like the fact, we are still thinking of a dollar sign at least somewhere on the brain where, you know, if we could all keep every single ball python in a four by two enclosure with UVB bulbs and, you know, three different hiding spots, both on the dry, both on the cool, one in the middle, all this stuff, then, you know, a pastel ball python is going to be $300 because that's how that works. And it's a weird fine line that we kind of have to tread, but I think. Oh no, go ahead and finish. Sorry. Oh yeah. Sorry. But you know, like you said that the pushing for enrichment and things like that, is like there's really easy ways for even people like us you know changing up the substrate adding different things throwing in a, even a cardboard tube maybe not with a ball python but you know, a really thick cardboard tube really th- yeah and just like changing plants and stuff and or even just having slightly larger tubs because you can buy larger tubs right um sometimes the cost gets a little bit high but it's still cheaper than you know full-blown pvc enclosures for every single snake right but you know that's all just you know you can't have it both ways. So you kind of have to make, I don't want to say allowances, but the right, right. we're moving in the right direction, I think. So there's a few things about that. First, I was just going to bring up a species like a ball python. This works better. You know, you get a more, a, a little bit higher metabolism, higher activity species. This might not work so well, but for a ball python, if his enclosure, his tub on your rack, let's say, is kind of his home base, that's his tunnel that he lives in, but you're able to get them out for handling and some stimulation yes. on a regular basis, that actually pretty closely mimics what my understanding of their behavior in nature would be, mm-hmm. where they're going to want to sit in their tunnel for quite a long time until they get hungry or until they get thirsty or until they get too cold or too hot and need to move. Or if it's breeding season, they're looking for a mate, but generally they want a home base. That's just a tight little thing underground and they'll come out to forage or or whatever. 
during the periods that they need to. So if you have your ball python in a, in a, what I, you know, I keep them in racks, as you saw, I yeah. consider that substandard though. I would love to give them more space, bigger water bowl, all that kind of stuff. So I force myself and it's not difficult because I love my animals, right. but it's time wise. I force myself to make sure every single snake gets out, gets held, uh, maybe gets a time, a turn, you know, swimming in, in, you know, just an inch or so of water. Cause again, they're not aquatic. Right. Something new. I like to take them outside in the summertime. Or you have a climbing wall. I like to let them go on the climbing wall so that every single animal gets to come out fairly regularly. And not just like I'm doing a spot check and I touch them real quick, but like actually out of the enclosure, uh, getting some mental stimulation, getting some exercise. And as long as keepers are doing that, I really am okay with the rack system. Yeah. If they never come out, except for, you know, every two months when you're deep cleaning all the bedding or whatever, that is kind of problematic to me. Uh, Yeah, that's true. Actually, I I saw a veterinary article where um, it was a boa constrictor, just like just a regular BI. Um, It turns out it was actually like a crazy high end morph, like an IMG VPI, something, something, something. Um, but it had had a rare form of bone cancer where it had started to have a lot of its uh, spine started to fuse together in whole sections where it would have taken a long time to do that, like maybe a year for the in the length of spine that had fused together, where even just that you would have noticed something off where it would not hold itself the same way or it would be very stiff in a certain place or almost like in pain where it would react if you try to hold it or move it in a way that it would affect that, that maybe could have been caught or that it didn't have to suffer as long as it did. Right. And, you know, that's kind of the difference between what used to be kind of the old school way and how people are moving toward now, or even people with, you know, larger collections like you or I, we do still do that. It's more than just a spot clean. It is just like you said interacting with them and giving them visual stimulation and mental stimulation and actual exercise. And it also allows you to observe them too, because even, even that we still interact with our animals a little bit differently than someone who just had, you know, three or four. Right. Just, we have to, but you know, you don't know, nobody knows your animals better than you and doing that gives you a better understanding of them. So. Yep. So you said something a few minutes ago that was, that's interesting to me. And I, I'm not saying that this is my opinion per se, but maybe like a devil's advocate kind of thing. You said mm-hmm. if we were to keep, as breeders, if we were to keep all our ball pythons in, you know, four or even six foot cages and they all had UV and they all had four hides and blah, blah, blah. Right. A basic pastel ball python is going to be 300 bucks. I think there is at least an argument to be made that would be a good thing. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, wholeheartedly. So for the snakes themselves, obviously having more space, having better environment, that's better, right? If, if we can really prove that for that animal, it is better, then it's better. Now, just us saying anthropomorphizing, you know, it wants more space. Yeah, they probably do. But no one's in the snake's head. We can't prove that with certainty, but we could try, you know, right. But from another point of view, so you have traveled and, and visited a lot more reptile people than I have. You went and visited Jonathan, right? Mm-hmm. I've talked with her a lot. She runs a great rescue. It's a, it's a very essential part of any community of reptile keepers, I feel, Absolutely. to have a really good quality rescue. She never, ever gets in animals as rescues that are worth more than two hundred dollars or so ever once in a blue moon but i'll bet you 99.9 percent of her animals are worth 75 dollars or less financially speaking because value when you're talking about a living animal to me connecting that with just finances is crazy yeah financially their value is always always low so if we took some changes as the breeding side of things that made it so that no herps of any sort were being sold for less than $300, an absolutely gigantic amount of the animals that are abandoned or neglected or even just straight up abused, would that would go down significantly. 
because you're pricing those types of people out. Yep. And that sounds so harsh. You know, I hate that these consumers who they dream about this snake, but they just can't afford it because they're poor, can't have it. That's sad. But at the same time, there's also people that are lazy or it's an impulse buy or whatever. Something happens and they just don't value this animal because they only paid 50 bucks for it. And sure. those are the ones that are starving or abandoned, left behind in apartments when people move out, set free in the woods, what have you. And so, you know, when, when I got started as a breeder, not just as a keeper, but actually mm -hmm. breeding animals, we thought to ourselves, we'll never have customers if all our animals are 600 bucks or $2,000 or $10,000. We'll never have customers. There's, there can't possibly be enough people buying expensive yeah. reptiles. So we were breeding relatively inexpensive ball pythons right as our first species and one we found out quickly that our more expensive animals were selling way faster it blew our minds we couldn't understand that <laughs> now, we're not producing ten thousand dollar animals but when we have a clutch that was you know say a recessive project a visual male to a, a het female mm -hmm. the visual pies that or combo pies that are four to six hundred dollars were selling just we couldn't hold on to them and the hats were taking a lot longer. Yep. They were way less expensive. So we were confused by that, but also these hats that are worth a hundred bucks, they're the ones that get abandoned. They're the ones that get underfed or, or people get bored of them and just give them to a rescue or give them to the pound where often they're put down. Yep. And so I don't want to, you know, harp on this for too long here, but I just, we have changed drastically our projects focusing more and more and more on the genetics that we love and they tend to be expensive, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I'm okay with that because one, we've discovered that that's okay for our business. In fact, it's better for our business if our average uh, sale price goes up, but two, it's better for the animals because they are astronomically less likely to be neglected. Yep. That's, that's 100% true. And that's, it's always something that I don't, I don't like to say I don't ever want to breed a normal, but for the reason of the point that you just made, there isn't really a less monetarily insignificantly valuable snake than a normal male ball python. Right. Like you can't give it away. Right. And that just is icky to me because like we brought up before with the mice, it's the same snake, still Python Regis. It's still the adorable pet rock that you want to boop at snoot or whatever. And they're gorgeous too. They're yeah. not actually less beautiful. They're just less strange and new and expensive. A, a less of the the mythical value that we've put on specific paint jobs. Yep. And I, I love the paint jobs. I love the morphs. I have got a bunch of, of cool morphs. But yep. man, some of my big normal females that we use, you know, for proving things out and stuff are some of the most beautiful animals in our entire collection. It's just as visual beauty goes, you yep. know, but financially they're not worth that much. And that's, that's kind of weird, you know, catch 22 that you're in where it's, what do you do? Like, you don't, I don't know. And that's the other thing too. If you're producing normals, then as a responsible breeder, you also know you're going to hold on to those for a while. Yep. I mean, that's why like people like Bob Clark, he doesn't produce normals and the ones that he do that he do, that he do that he does uh king cobra food which again it's a lot of people me saying that will probably trigger some folks all the 18 people that listen to this podcast for a while but <laughs> uh you know that's that's the that's the reality of it you know when you have as i said before just normal ball pythons normal burmy pipe burmese python babies they're not worth a whole lot so you yep. know Crank it out somehow, I guess. And, you know, if we're okay with feeding off rats and rabbits and stuff, ethically, why can't we feed off normal ball pythons or whatever? I mean, I, that, that gives me, like, the, the goosebumps. I just, it seems so crazy to me because these are, like, the animals that we're trying to produce on purpose. But right. at the same time, is a ball python's life worth more than a rabbit? It's true. And I mean, if you think about the actual care of the animals you're giving it to, a very diet would be probably, well, not probably, Certainly. actually proven that it will be more beneficial to them if they are 
you know, a generalist species, you know, a king snake or a dry marcon or something like that, where you can feed a ball python, two rats, a mouse, part of a fish, another snake, more rats, and you just vary it up like that, it's a better balanced diet for them. But yeah. again, like you said, it just, yeah, goosebumps. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we even, we can recognize that it's weird, but we, no, oh, geez, this microphone. Oh, sorry. I'm trying. I to... hope my sound quality is okay. I'm just using the laptop speaker. No, you're doing pretty good. Um, I don't know why we, we invested a little bit into a, a decent micro, like a good, like, uh, like a good podcasting microphone, not like a Joe Rogan level thing, but you know, a decent microphone and a cool little pop filter. But the setup that I have, this is the only room in the house that has carpet, which is better for the noise isolation and things like that. And I have no good way to hold the microphone, even with like a little, the swing arm that I have for it. And so like, if you looked at my setup now, I'm sitting on a wooden uh, dining room table chair and it's on, and the laptop that I'm working off of is sitting on like a little uh, adjustable metal rack. And then the pop filter sitting on my camera stand. <laughs> Right. So, eh. but yeah, sorry. I'm just trying to, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to get it well for like the audio quality. Um, and even then it's a fight sometimes like people don't know to kind of get up on it or that they're, they're just kind of quiet or whatever it is. Your, but. your audio to me, what I'm hearing sounds superb. Well, hooray. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Yeti, Yeti microphones plug. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so to kind of move away from the not so happy parts of the reality of dealing with, you know, living animals and things like that, um, do you have any fun projects that you have going this year that we didn't get too, too much into? I don't think this snake had arrived when you were here. If you can give me, I know that, you know, you're recording like. No, you're good. I can vamp. I'll be real back. Real quickly, I'll be back. No, you're good. You're good. Yeah, that's actually we just uh, just started following him too on social media because it's kind of the appropriate thing to do. And I think I know what snake he's going to pull out, which is super cool. Um, I, I don't work with any of these guys. Oh, there we go. Coming back. Yes, I was right. So my lights all turned off so you can't see gray and it's just a little computer. But yep. uh, this guy and he he likes to bite me, but that's OK. <laughs> You know, all you ball python people already know this, but for anyone who's into reptiles, but maybe not the ball pythons, this is a sunset. It's a recessive gene in ball pythons. Uh, it's got a red color. Uh, you know, I say red. It's red undertones or orange maybe would be a better word. Um, similar maybe to like a blood boa. Yeah, in yeah, I would say that's a good. Yeah. And the reason it's it's so exciting to me is because I just don't know of any other morph that puts this color into ball pythons whatsoever and it's also got a really ex extremely busy pattern i don't know i just i've always loved these they finally have come down in price enough for us little guys to save right. up for a while and get into um i'm real happy with them got them from uh, brad boa and brock wagner oh cool they do their sunset stuff uh jointly really really beautiful morph i think so anyway you know some people are like ah oh, it's just a it's just a brown snake i'm like well you know the eye of the beholder but i love it i think it's and it's not just the color that pattern is very unique as well with the very um elongated stretched out alien heads and everything yeah that's uh there's some ghis that are like that and i really love the ghi yep. but the yeah that's for any of you guys who can't see it too well with the with the camera um yeah, They're I called call sunset it. because it literally looks like a sunset on a snake body, like that perfect blend hue of the kind of like warm daylight down to, yeah, that might help a little bit, down to those like red and orange hues, like at the setting sun. That's what the snake looks like. And they're super cool. Very cool. And I always like recessive traits anyways. Um, it's just, it's more satisfying when you produce them because it took it took more work. <laughs> that is true. And that's, that's definitely something that I probably should have done where I, you know, I saw a lot of like the incomplete dominance that I thought were really cool. And so instead of investing in like a clown project, a plot, a pied or the desert ghost, 
I would just find one-off oddballs that just kind of were a good example or just a kind of a weird morph or a, we- a weird thing of just a regular morph that were just a little off, like an extremely dark GHI or a really high white kind of pixelated looking calico or an orange dream that holds its color into adulthood better. That's more kind of what I did. So I'm making not the really nice recessives, which would probably behoove me in the end, uh, <laughs> but just kind of a little bit different or cleaner looking like normal single, double, triple gene animals that. And, you know, I think, though, you probably did it right if you were getting the animals that excited you the most. That's what I like to tell myself. Yes, it's that. All right. I, I think know- it's really cool. Of course, when you're doing it as a business, some of your decisions really do need to be made with finances in mind. But if you end up skewing it all your choices too far that way, you end up not liking your own collection. And that would be insane. To be a reptile breeder who doesn't even actually buy the animals you most enjoy, to me, that's crazy. Yeah, I think that's actually exactly what happened when the ball pythons exploded. Um, like I talked to a lot of the kind of older guys that have been doing it for like 20, 30 years that were all colubrid people and even some lizard people. And then when the ball Python morse started to get proved out, they would sell their collections and then we're just buying those, you know, 10 to $50,000 snakes that were the fresh imports or the hets. Yep. And now there's, I guess, morphs that are just gone. Like they're, they're not there. Like some specific lines of albino and exanthic and like san diego gopher snakes and different types of king snakes they're just we don't we won't get them anymore yep because that's exactly what people did they put the dollar sign over the passion and the actual animals themselves yep and since it's almost impossible to get like rich rich doing reptiles i'm not saying you can't do it as a as a living i think you can make great living in reptiles if you want to just be a filthy rich person, you should probably pick a different career. <laughs> yep. And so that being said, stick with the animals that you most enjoy. And you know, I've I've gone back and forth on this because what if it's an animal that is an extremely advanced husbandry species and maybe you're not super experienced with that group of animals. Even in that case, I would say do your research, get a mentor, Contact the experts in that species as much as you can, and maybe even wait six or 10 months just to make sure that you really are dedicated, that you've got all the housing for it prepared. But if it's still what you know you want, the starter reptile idea to me is just flawed. You know, people are like, oh, you really want to monitor, start with a bearded dragon because they're easier. I'm like, well, what if you don't want a bearded dragon? I love beardies, but what if somebody's like dead set on a, a what? My first lizard ever was a tree monitor. <laughs> that's true very advanced keeping re- you know relatively speaking but i just loved them i always did and so i i tracked down the best breeders in the world i ended up going with canadian cold blood uh brandon in canada and uh he's spectacular i spent hours and hours and hours on the phone with this poor man <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> i hadn't spent one dollar yet And he had just given me a wealth of information, all his expertise, um, really helped me with my setup, getting ready for feeding them, humidity, lighting, everything imaginable. And I bought a little captive bred baby from him and I've never regretted it. You know, I'm so glad that I didn't go with a starter species. I just, I got the animal that I wanted, but it took me like a year of preparation and some people aren't willing to wait. It's true. That's there's there's a lot of instant gratification. I'm certainly guilty of that as well. But that's that's actually the reason why. Like uh uh like when you brought out the in, when you when you brought out your indigo when I was over, um, uh-huh. my eyes kind of lit up because I really want to get into them. But I know just right now I can't yet, and I want to learn a little bit more about them. Like I know enough to keep them alive and keep them healthy, but I want to just know a little bit more. Right. You're so in like, you're in the Denver area. Mm-hmm. So maybe I shouldn't tell you this if you're trying to have some restraint. There is one of the best breeders of Eastern Indigos in Colorado, so you wouldn't even have to get the permit. Oh, I'm aware of him. I have several of his pine snakes. <laughs> so I actually have a uh, a pair on hold from him. Oh, I'll really? Later this summer when I get my permit. Nice. Yeah, it's. Uh, I've been eyeballing some black pine snakes from him, too. But my, I keep getting distracted by uh, 
my my eyes keep wandering a little bit. Like I really love I love the ball pythons and I like playing the Frankenstein morphs and stuff, but I also like getting into other species of the different colubrids and things like that. And so as a bit of a hobbyist, I find like a one off. Like I have a lot of single males. <laughs> like I have one male yellowtail Kribo. I have one female rhino rat snake. Like I, I don't have a lot of pairs which can get me some flack from a lot of people in the community, but yeah. Yeah. Well, for someone who says that uh, they like to bite you, he's doing pretty good. He's doing great today. You know what, though? I got a meal into him, his first meal with me, mm-hmm. two or three days ago, and he, he's much calmer and happier now. So maybe he was just uh, grumpy. He was, he was hangry. Maybe a little bit. That's cool. Do you already have a, a female picked out for him? Uh, so we did a trade a couple of years ago with a friend of ours in Florida, and he sent us a Butter Jungle Woma Poss Het Clown Poss Het Sunset. Oh, good Lord. We proved out the Het Clown. She is Het Clown. Uh, so we were like, well, we really got to try and prove out her Het Sunset at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, we were planning to just get a Het Male. Maybe like a combo of some kind, Het Male. Right. Um, but I was already buying a clown combo from Brad Boa and stinker that he is. He was like, Hey, I've got this male sunset. I know. you." <laughs> and I was like, Oh, you're killing me. And my wife took one look at the pictures and was like, yes. Oh, man. So that was that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, that's really cool though. Yeah, so that that will be his first lady love. We will also, you know, he's he's only a little guy right now. He's maybe 350 grams or so. Right. But uh, when he's grown up, maybe by this fall, if he eats really well, because he's a 2020 baby, so he'd be old enough. I just, I don't like breeding my males super tiny and certainly not to lots of females if they are on the smaller end. Right. Um, but, you know, if he hits five or 600 grams, I'll throw him to a couple girls this this winter. Um, but, uh, a desert ghost female, a pied female, mm-hmm. and maybe like a banana cinnamon female or something like that. I had a feeling you were going to say the desert ghost. And I'm kind of curious to see how that would end up because that's the desert ghost kind of lightens and cleans. Yes. And does I'm a little concerned about that one. I'm only going to do it if they end up being awesome. I know, uh, Miguel at always evolving pythons has several, double hat to double hat um desert ghost sunsets going this year so he hmm. ought to produce the first visual this year if they're awesome then he will this guy <laughs> here will go to a desert ghost if they're if they're underwhelming he probably won't yeah that's that, that's like the like the double hat clown pieds i never thought it was like an extremely overwhelmingly stunning snake and so i just kind of went eh. like a hypo pied or a hypo clown i think is a little bit of a better combo than those two. Right. But I like like okay. a G-stripe pied is just kind of superfluous, I guess, which sounds awful to say, but. I agree. I, you know, it's funny because tri-stripe is one of my top three favorite genes in ball pythons. I just love it. I love it so much. I don't really like genetic stripe and it's very similar in many ways to the tri-stripe, but I just don't like it. Yeah. And I, I don't I couldn't even tell you why exactly. I just I love the tri stripes, at least the good <laughs> tri stripes. And and I've not I'm not crazy about the G stripes, but uh that that's a, it goes back to what we were just saying though. You should really work with the species and the morphs within those species that you like. Yep, that's why a lot of my projects are in the bell complex, a lot of pides, a lot of orange dreams, stuff like that, where it's kind of that middle ground animal like that three to seven hundred dollar realm where it's right you know either a good a good first like intro pet where it's not a disposable pet which is an awful but real thing to say uh or a decent like jump into like a more project of your own yep that's really cool yeah, man. And talking to you makes me want to get into more ball python morphs. You're, you're killing me. <laughs> yeah, I love them. And and it's not just because of all the awesome morphs. 
I like their size. I like that they're inquisitive, but they're not super quick and whippy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like just their look. They're these chubby little. <laughs> I just like them. I think yep. it's a great snake, you know. No, no, I totally get that. That's that's why they were uh, some of my first snakes were a boa constrictor because I just always liked them. They're not the smartest snake. Their feeding response can be a little intimidating once you get like a seven, eight foot long boa. And then I went, oh, ball pythons. They're just a really cool, just hang out, chill snake, which, you know, sometimes in the mood to play and run and dodge a little bit. But other times it's really fun to just kind of sit, chill and enjoy the beauty of an animal. Right. Right. And that's ball pythons in general. Yep. If you want to play with a snake, go with like a dry marcon. If you want yeah. to like sit with a snake and be soothed, go with like a python or something. Yep. And that's that's definitely something that I've seen that like when I have a really stressful day, uh, you know, I don't I don't I always wanted to have a little farm where for like a normal stressful day I can come in, just chill with the ball pythons. On a good day I can play with like some you know, big, quick colubrids. And on a really, really bad day, I have a fainting goat, so I can just yell at it, and it'll fall over. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, that makes me sound like a bad person, but... <laughs> Which is actually... Uh, I learned why they do that. That's actually a weird thing that it was this almost faulty gene that they found it did that, and so... Uh, shepherds used to specifically breed animals that had that gene so that way they would do that when a predator would show up and it would take the less expensive and valuable goat and all the sheep and everything else would take off that's actually hilarious and it's it's just one more like kind of overlapping thing where like we all breed for these specific mostly you know with phenotypical traits but they're still genes right we all just have these funny little things that we are specifically breeding for that kind of overlap and in the plant world too. Yep. Yep. But no. Eh. Cute little thing. <laughs> well, um, I think we're actually at a pretty good time here. Um, yeah. It was really cool just to sit and talk with you again. Cause like I said, I don't, I don't get too, too many ball Python people on. Um, but it's really cool just to talk to somebody who's still just super passionate with just the snakes in general, not just specific, like, I just love my super intensity, high intensity, orange dream, desert ghost pied project. And that's all I can talk about. Cause I I was talking to somebody about that and that's all they wanted to do was just talk about their specific, just like 2021 back and forth projects. And I went, eh. I mean, that's Although, cool, and I'm glad that you're that you're happy for with it, but I'll bet that uh, high intensity super orange dream desert ghost pied would be pretty freaking sweet. <laughs> I'll it is bet really Ozzy cool. has one already. Yeah. Have you uh have, have you seen um Ozzy Boyd's stuff? Yeah, I've been I follow his all his stuff. I'm so glad he's back on YouTube too. Yeah. That, yeah, there you go. If you wanna if you wanna learn how to be a, a successful reptile breeder and you know be a, I think I think he might be a millionaire actually. Yeah, well, because he has like four different businesses. He's in real estate. He's he in is. ball pythons. He does a huge rodent operation. Yep, but um, a lot of his you know business ideals and things can be put into practice with kind of whatever you want to do. Yep, yep. No, he is he's a master. Yep. Yep. Well. I uh, really want to thank you so much because it's uh, eleven, almost eleven thirty where I'm at. Yeah, I forget sometimes this time. Oh, uh, I forgot how time zones worked the other day, and I had someone from Florida um, go the other way, so I was just like sitting online for like three hours before they. <laughs> yeah, time zone. It's. Uh, uh, but thank you, thank you so much for uh, you know coming on and just talking again a little bit and you know. See Anytime. what's really cool up there. Anytime. Yeah, we kind of got a little away from Alaska a bit, but that's still okay. Yeah. It's hard not to sometimes. Yep. But um, if anybody is out there, although I think you have a little bit of a larger following than I do, um, if anyone's interested in learning more about your really cool projects and ball pythons or 
uh, Dominican boas or just kind of keeping in general, uh, where can they find you? So probably our, our biggest social media platform is YouTube or the reptile barn. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're on Instagram also as the reptile barn. Don't go to our Facebook. We don't ever do anything there <laughs> other than like we copy our Instagram posts over to Facebook. So if that's your platform of choice, you'll see all our, you know, our little Instagram styled posts, right. We have a website and we're actually finally starting to put a little more work into it. But if you're, you know, unless you're looking to, to maybe buy a specific thing, or if you're here locally and want to uh, come see stuff, um, you know, our, our email might be the best way to just, you know, talk to me, the reptile barn at gmail.com. Cool. I'll put a, I'll put links down to most of your stuff down at the bottom of this and cool. And uh, you're actually your, your video uh, that we did with you. I think, I think yours is coming out before Jonathan's, I think it's coming out this Saturday. Okay. So I'll be sure to, I got to look at the footage my wife took uh, while you were here. I'll, I'll put yours up first and I'll see, I don't know if she filmed everything or if she just took little snippets. Right. Um, but yeah, at some point we'll put it up too, but definitely not before you put yours up. I, I kind of wanted a bit of a quick turnaround on it this time, but normally they'll sit in like the video editing app for like three months, unfortunately, sometimes. So. Oh, I get that. We have a couple of vlogs we filmed like in the winter that I'm just like, we got to get these out. I still had long hair. Like this, <laughs> You're going to be like, what? That did take me aback a little bit because yeah, when I was when I first found out about you guys, I was like, "Wait, who are you?" Yep. <laughs> yep. It's my annual tradition. I I grow it out all year, but it gets to like springtime and starts to warm up outside. I'm like, "Oh, I gotta cut it." Yep. <laughs> it grows fast though, so you know by the time next spring rolls around, it's gonna be curly into my shoulders again. Fun. All right. Well, thank you so much again. I really do appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me on oh yeah and uh you know wish you luck on all the ventures moving into your new house um hopefully the reptile expo maybe uh you know with things opening up and we have a lot of people coming out you know over the summer to alaska maybe they can come to your expo too that'd be awesome so cool thank you again thank you thank you thank you i'm just going to keep repeating myself uh Sounds and good. uh yeah hopefully uh talk to you again soon and maybe even pick up a couple snakes from you cool cool thank you all right have a good night thanks you too